Welcome to Evolution Fast Forward. Today, I am very happy to share with you that I am starting a new podcast series on the book, The Synthesis of Yoga by Sri Aurobindo. My name is Manoj Pavitran and I live in Oroville, an international spiritual community near in South India, near Pondicherry. I joined here in 95, but I came here because I was deeply influenced by Sri Aurobindo. And the first book that I came across of Sri Aurobindo was this one, The Synthesis of Yoga. It was in 89. I had no clue that this book will be completely changing the whole direction of my life and open up an entirely new possibility. So I'm so happy to really come back to this book, even though I had been reading this book for the last, say, 35 years now. And first five years, I was reading it every day continuously. And then I moved on to other books of Sri Aurobindo. But this was the pivotal book. And it's a great joy to share this book with you. And my main reason for starting this podcast is my own sadhana. Because reading Sri Aurobindo was really the most transformative experience in my life. And this book was the starting point. So getting back to his writings and diving deep into those writings, it's really like a purifying, transformative experience. And I want to share that with you. Second is, I come across many people who who experience that Sri Aurobindo's writings are difficult to enter into. That seems to be dense. Though when I started reading, I was not so proficient in English. And I used to read primarily my mother tongue, which is Malayalam. But somehow I felt the connection, connection with him. And there was a sense of intuitive understanding. It is much later I began to understand intellectually, but the very act of reading created the conditions within me to understand him. Consistent, persistent reading and a loving engagement. Not so much in a critical, analytical way, but lovingly just immersing in the book as if the book is really like a portal through which you can enter into the consciousness of Sri Aurobindo. And that consciousness enters, infuses, and does whatsoever is necessary for our progress and to really understand what he is trying to communicate through this book. And for those who are into yoga and a spiritual seeker, you may be finding it hard to understand the complex diversity that is available in India. So many different schools of thought, having different perspectives on uh, what is the purpose of this inner transformation or inner journey, and different methodologies that are often contradictory. Even purposes are contradictory. So how to find a perspective from which you can understand the entire complexity of various spiritual traditions, not only Indian spiritual traditions, but also the modern Western approaches, and have a perspective where everything has its place, the right place, so that there is an integral view where nothing is left out. So this book is a grand synthesis of both East and West, and within East itself, the entire historic development of yogic processes. 
And uh, when I first saw this book, when I saw the book word yoga, my thought was yoga means asanas. And I looked at the book, it was a thick, dense book, nothing but text, 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 page after page. No diagrams, no chakras, nothing. No photographs, dense, thick book. But that fascinated me. And that's how really I got into it. It was the very early stages of my, my own personal journey as a seeker. And this is the book that gave me direction, gave me clarity, gave me the vision of what lies ahead. So welcome to The Synthesis of Yoga by Sri Aurobindo. The title of the book, The Synthesis of Yoga, comes with the subtitle, it is, All Life is Yoga. Now that phrase, in a way, is the distilled essence of the entire book. All life is yoga. Usually, we consider our sadhana or practice or asana, so whatever it is, as a practice that stands on its own and our life is something separate. And one thing is our life, other is the collective life and life in nature. And here he is saying, all life is yoga. It's a powerful statement, a very mysterious statement. And this statement really hooked me into the mystery of this book. And we start with the introduction. This book is made of an introductory part followed by four different parts of the book covering different aspects of yoga. The introduction has five chapters. That's where he deals with the whole notion of synthesis, bringing the overview of all the yogic traditions and how the synthesis can be arrived at. So I will go through the first chapter, first paragraph, line by line. Today I'm thinking of taking up just two lines. The first chapter is made of four paragraphs, big paragraphs, and Sherbindo's lines are quite long usually. And each line is a world in itself that we can really dive into to meditate on. Meditate upon each line, each word. That's how we can enter into the depth of the richness that is contained in these lines. So my idea is to read through these lines and uh, take up each line. So we will go into the first chapter. That's called Life and Yoga. These are the two aspects, Life and Yoga. And he starts like this. There are two necessities of nature's workings. This is interesting, nature's workings. The first image that he is bringing into us, into our awareness, is nature. This is a book on yoga, synthesis of yoga, and the first image, the first character of the story is nature. When we hear the word nature, we think about the mountains, rivers, oceans, seasons, all that. There is a whole material nature. And what does he mean by nature? Is it only material nature? Is it something beyond all that? We will discover. So let's get back to the line. There are two necessities, two necessities of nature's workings. He's not saying two laws, he's saying two necessities of nature's workings, which seem always to intervene in the greater forms of human activity. So here is human activity. Then there are these two necessities of nature's working, intervening, always intervening into this greater forms of human activity. What could be the greater forms of human activity? Let's just 
dwell on that idea of greater forms of human activity. Forms of human activity. Say, if we look at this animal world, there is regular sleep, eat, mate, play, sleep, eat, mate, play. Very routine activities. Mundane, regular, routine activities. Large number of people live at that level. But let's consider this as the regular mundane activities. What could be greater forms of human activity? What is beyond survival? See, when we are into music, exploring music, it's not about survival. There is something else that is pushing us towards the rasa, the delight of music. There is something that is coming through it. Or a philosopher meditating upon the complex challenges and complex questions. Or a mathematician trying to solve a complex problem. Or a scientist exploring to find truth about nature. These are all higher forms of human activities. So let's proceed. There are two necessities of nature's workings which seem always to intervene in the greater forms of human activity. Whether these belong to our ordinary fields of movement or seek those exceptional spheres and fulfillments which appear to us high and divine. So a pursuit like music, science, philosophy, mathematics, these are all really higher forms of human activity. But there are some forms of human activities that seems to be, appear to us as high and divine. So if we take the life of Buddha, or Christ, something was shining through them, an aspect of divine dimension that was radiating, which people recognized and worshipped and they became the icons. There are such exceptional individuals historically, even in modern times. If we, when we look at life of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Aurobindo, we see something exceptional unfolding, something divine that is unfolding, that is way beyond our grasp. So there are these ordinary fields of movement that is happening, and there are also these exceptional movements that are unfolding. And these two necessities of nature's workings are always intervening into these forms of human activity. Now, let's find out what are these two necessities. He says, every such form tends towards a harmonized complexity and totality. Every such form tends towards a harmonized complexity and totality, which again breaks apart into various channels of special effort and tendency, only to, re, only to unite once more in a larger and more poisoned synthesis. So here there are multiple things happening. One is a movement towards harmonized complexity and totality. The other is tendency towards specialization and diversification, which again come together for a greater harmony, harmonious synthesization. Coming together for a greater harmony and synthesis. So there is a movement from simple to complex and to further higher levels of complexity. In that process, whatsoever is that simple starting point will diversify into multiple specialized channels of action. 
which again will come together for a greater complex harmony and totality. It will again diversify and move towards further higher levels of synthesis where there is a totality and harmony and complexity which is higher than the preceding level. So we can say there is a gradual progression from simple to more and more complex forms. And we can see that in the evolutionary process in nature, it is moving from simple to complex developments. If we take, let's say, music, our regular approach to music, a form of human activity, and music itself will specialize into diversified fields, the vocalists and instrumental musicians, and they all specialize in different lines. Some become a drummer, some is into flute, someone is into violin. And then they all come together for a grand orchestra or a symphony together. All these diversified, unique instruments coming together. Not only that, when they are able to come together, then the next challenge is how do we integrate higher levels of complexity? So then you look at what are the other cultures, their musical instruments, musical traditions. How do we bring these things together and find a greater synthesis? So we will find these days musical fusion that is happening where elements from different cultures are brought together, instruments are coming together and fusing into greater synthesis, a greater harmony. So there is an instinct in us to move from simple to more and more complex harmonies. When we succeed in arriving at something complex, accomplished, then comes what is the next level of the game and higher levels of synthesis. So every such form tends towards a harmonized complexity and totality, which again breaks apart into various channels of special effort and tendency only to unite once more in a larger and more poisoned synthesis. So the new synthesis will be richer than the previous synthesis and it encompasses larger complexity. So this is really the movement of evolution that is happening and our human activities, all the forms of human activities are moving towards higher and higher levels of complexity. And whatsoever be the synthesis we arrive at, it will again diversify into specialized efforts. And there will be an urge to synthesize. So this movement, it's a necessity and it's part of nature's working. So that's the first two lines. Now let's look at the next line where he describes the second necessity. Now we covered the first necessity. Secondly, development into forms is an imperative rule of effective manifestation. This is not the full sentence, it is just the first part of the sentence. Development into forms is an imperative rule, it's imperative, rule of effective manifestation. From the unmanifest, things coming to manifestation. Say we have a nebulous idea, we need to get clarity on the idea, define it, define the boundary conditions, give it a clear form and concretize it, eventually materialize it. So development into forms is an imperative rule of effective manifestation, to be effective in manifestation. When you don't have the ability to transform a nebulous vague idea into a clear concrete form, you will not also have the capacity to manifest anything. It will stay in the vague state. So a development into forms is an imperative rule of effective manifestation. Yet, all truth and practice, all truth and practice, all truth and practice, too strictly formulated, becomes old and loses much, if not all, of its 
virtue. All truth and practice too strictly formulated becomes old and loses much, if not all, of its virtue. So when we build our social institutions, when the society is evolving, we see that many of the institutions become fossilized, old, not able to respond to the changing social context. Religions, for example, even though they still have a strong grip, we see that various religious forms are so frozen in their definition of this is the right thing to do, and they cling to that form, and in that process it becomes fossilized, and it cannot really deal with the emerging complexity of life. Or even if you look at our educational institutions, in today's world, AI has come and there is a revolution that is unfolding. Unless these institutions learn to respond to it and integrate it, they will be in crisis. So there is a general crisis in the world. All the institutions that we created in the past are in crisis whether it is educational institutions, political institutions, social institutions, religious institutions, they are all in crisis. So all truth and practice too strictly formulated. When things are formulated, usually it's a response to an emerging situation, a life situation, to bring in a change you are taking new ideas, giving it form. In that formulation, which was living at that time, but a few decades down the line, few centuries down the line, what you formulated no more hold as true in the new social context. So development into forms is an imperative rule of effective manifestation, yet all truth and practice too strictly formulated becomes old and loses much, if not all, of its virtue. All our social customs and practices, they constantly become obsolete. This is the nature of evolutionary process. It must be constantly renovated by fresh streams of the spirit. It must be constantly renovated by fresh streams of the spirit, revivifying the dead or dying vehicle and changing it, if it is to acquire new life. So there is a need to bring in fresh spirit and life into old institutions, otherwise they will die. If they are to survive and revive, they need to open to the new spirit. And here is an incredibly beautiful statement. To be perpetually reborn is the condition of a material immortality. Material immortality. The spirit may be immortal, unborn. Here, talking about material immortality, something taken birth in our material world, it has to continuously go through the process of rebirth. Perpetually reborn is the condition of a material immortality. So the picture is very, very fascinating. The two necessities. One is this evolution from simple to more and more complex forms where it diversify into specialized fields, come back to synthesis, again diversify synthesis. So there is progression there is a rebirth that is happening all the time when it is re-imagined, fresh spirit is brought into the dying vehicle. So there is a rebirth that is happening. So there is a process of rebirth and there is a process of increasing complexity towards which things are evolving. And these are two necessities of nature's workings. And they are constantly intervening into our human activities, all the forms of human activities come under these two necessities.
So we ourselves need to continuously reboot ourselves, reinvent ourselves, especially when in today's world, when world is changing so rapidly, not only the institutions, individually we need to continuously reinvent ourselves, continuously adopt and learn and synthesize whatever is newly emerging. So there is this whole process of evolution and continuous rebirth. So that's the first movement in this paragraph. So in this first movement, Sri Aurobindo has given a broad picture of nature's workings intervening into human activities. It is kind of a pattern, a global universal pattern that is applicable everywhere, kind of timeless pattern and these are necessities. Now Sri Aurobindo is moving into another perspective. From this broad perspective on nature, he comes down to, we are in an age full of the throes of travail when all forms of thought and activity, when all forms of thought and activity that have in themselves any strong power of utility or any secret virtue of persistence are being subjected to a supreme test and given their opportunity of rebirth. So now he has come to the present time. So remember he wrote this in 1914. At that time, this rapid change was already beginning and he is looking into the future and he's looking at the whole world and he's referring to the age. We are in an age full of the throes of travail <clears throat> when all forms of thought and activity, all forms of thought and activity that have in themselves any strong power of utility. So there are forms of thought and activity that have some strong power of utility or any secret virtue of persistence because some forms of thought and activity persist across centuries, across millennia. They don't die because there is some virtue in them. So there are classic books and knowledge bases that coming from millennia that survive the onslaught of time. They become timeless classic. So all forms of thought and activity that have in themselves any strong power of utility or any secret virtue of persistence. There should be some essential truth that gives it the strength to persist, to survive the onslaught of time, are being subjected to a supreme test. Now we are in that supreme test and given their opportunity of rebirth, all forms of thought and activity. So we can see when the science took birth, science was questioning all the old superstitions and breaking all those forms of thought and activity that had no virtue in it and throwing things away. But religions are still there. There is some essential kernel that is the reason why they survive and continue. And not just religion, there are spiritual traditions surviving across millennia. Many things are undergoing rebirth. Only those that have some secret virtue, certain deep truth in them will survive. So the superficial forms will die away the essential kernel of the truth will be rekindled and taking rebirth. It's an opportunity of rebirth. The world today represents the aspect of a huge cauldron of Medea. Cauldron of Medea. It's a, an image coming from the Greek mythology. Medea is a female character who was someone who had this large cauldron in which she could rejuvenate life. Now, 
world today represents the aspect of a huge cauldron of Medea, in which all things are being cast, shredded into pieces, experimented upon, combined and recombined, either to perish and provide the scattered materials of new forms or to emerge rejuvenated and changed for a fresh term of existence. And we can see that across the world there is this churning and boiling happening. And scientific investigation is looking into everything. And we can see scientists exploring yogic traditions. The monks and yogins are brought under the scrutiny of scientific investigation. Science itself getting challenged by the persistence of a deeper truth that religions and spiritual traditions represented. Because in the early stages of scientific development, there was a complete rejection of everything that religion stood for, spiritual tradition stood for. But now science has regained a level of maturity and the young childhood ages over and there is a maturity with which science is now looking at the, what makes them survive, what is the essential truth these institutions, these forms of thoughts and activities represent. And science is a huge agent. Science and technology is a huge agent of this cauldron of Medea. And uh, everything is getting cooked. Everything is getting shredded into pieces, experimented upon, combined and recombined, either to perish and provide the scattered material of new forms or to emerge rejuvenated and changed for a fresh term of existence. So that's an incredible picture. So he moved from showing the whole nature's two necessities, universal pattern, the two necessities intervening into human activities. Now in the current age, we are in this throes of this melting pot where Things are given a chance to be reborn. And only those forms and activities that have some deep truth, they will survive. So let's now move on to the next line. Indian yoga, in its essence, a special action or formulation of certain great powers of nature. Indian yoga, in its essence, in its essence, he is not talking about in its specific forms, in its essence, a special action or formulation of certain great powers of nature. Now he is coming back to nature again. He started with nature, now he is coming back to nature in the context of dealing with a specific movement of yoga. He is saying it is a formulation of certain great powers of nature, a special action, itself specialized, divided and variously formulated. The yogic traditions of India, there is long history and there are so many diverse forms of specialized schools, specialized practices, specialized approaches. So there is specialized, divided and variously formulated the whole movement is potentially one of these dynamic elements of the future life of humanity. The future life of humanity. Indian yoga, he is saying, is a dynamic element. It's one of these dynamic elements of the future life of humanity because it has some deep truth and that's what he will be bringing out in this book, the deep truth of yoga. And so let's read again, Indian yoga in its essence is a special action or formulation of certain great powers of nature, itself specialized, divided and variously formulated. Remember, 
yoga, diversified practices, and synthesis. That's where we are heading. It's potentially one of these dynamic elements of future life of humanity. It's a dynamic element, means it can actually actively transform human nature. The child of immemorial ages, the child of immemorial ages, we do not know how old is yoga. It's really, really ancient. Often people go back to only up to Patanjali's Yoga Sutra because that is where the word yoga become very prominently visible. But what is beyond as the Upanishads and the Vedas, the word yoga is not so much visible. So people do not often understand that the yogic knowledge hidden in these very, very ancient lineages, knowledge base. So child of immemorial ages, preserved by its vitality and truth into our modern times. So this yoga has survived onslaught of time for many, many millennia, preserved by its vitality. It's very strong in its life force, its vitality and truth into our modern times. It is now emerging. It is now emerging. This is, he is writing in 1914 from the secret schools and ascetic retreats in which it had taken refuge. Yoga had taken refuge in secret schools and ascetic retreats. This is a particular movement that happened in India over the last 1000 years. The yogins of India withdrew from the active engagement with the world. Till a thousand years ago, India was spreading across the world. Whole Asian countries where Indian culture was spreading. But somewhere, some thousand years ago, India started returning and retreating into secret schools and ascetic retreats. And ascetic tendencies grew in India. So is now emerging from the secret schools and ascetic retreats in which it had taken refuge and is seeking its place in the future sum of living human powers and utilities. So from that ascetic retreats and secret schools, it has come out. You can see Indian yoga teachers, gurus going around the world and sharing this deep knowledge with the world. And this is seeking its place in the future sum of living human powers, living human powers and utilities. So yoga is finding its place. But, but it has to rediscover itself because there are a great deal of misconceptions about yoga and spiritual growth. This is very important to really dive into. Sri Aurobindo will be going into these details, but it has to first rediscover itself, bring to the surface the profoundest reason of its being. Why yoga? What is the reason for developing various schools of yogic practices, what is the reason, the deepest, the profoundest reason. And that general truth and that unceasing aim of nature which it represents. Here he is again dropping a hint. The unceasing aim of nature. Nature is again coming back. You see, he started with the vision of nature, two necessities of nature intervening into human activities and human beings and the yogic traditions are actually representing the unceasing aim of nature and yogic traditions utilizes specialized powers of nature so but it has to rediscover itself bring to surface the profoundest reason of its being in that general truth and that unceasing aim of unceasing aim of nature which it represents and find by virtue of this 
new self knowledge and self appreciation first is rediscovering itself so that there is the yoga understands itself that it is representing an aim of nature unceasing aim of nature and a new self appreciation of understanding its deepest truth and find by virtue of this new self knowledge and self appreciation its own recovered and larger synthesis so that this conflicting schools of philosophies and practices can be brought together in a harmonized synthesized perspective recognizing itself it will enter more easily and powerfully into the reorganized life of the race human race and life on earth is getting reorganized we can see that small like over millennia small kingdoms becoming larger and larger empires and in this last few centuries nation states emerging now a global civilization emerging moving towards a grand global synthesis where everything is getting reorganized and there is this whole new creative power that is emerging on earth so re organizing itself it will enter more easily and powerfully into the reorganized life of the race which its process claim to lead yogic process is claiming to lead within into the most secret penetralia and upward into the highest altitudes of existence and personality now this might sound a bit abstract but it is a structural key to sri aurobindo's thought one key is within into the most secret penetralia there is a deep secret within us that is within then there is an upward into the highest altitudes of existence and personality often yogic tradition speaks about the higher you go personality aspect is vanished there is emptiness formless and here is talking about upward into the highest altitudes of existence and personality now that is the end of the first paragraph so in this first paragraph of the chapter we see three movements first is this large pattern of nature's workings intervening into higher forms of human activities the second movement is where he is looking at the whole world as a cauldron of media our current age where everything is getting boiled into a process of rebirth where anything that has some value and strength to be reborn will be reborn and then he is coming to indian yoga that is survived millennia many many millennia and it has reached this modern times and he sees yoga as a critical a very important dynamic element that will enter into the future life of humanity and he wrote this in 1914 and when india got freedom he gave a message to the nation and in which he gave his five dreams the fourth dream is very much connected with this let me read that another dream the spiritual gift of india to the world has already begun this is already 47 the spiritual gift of india had already begun India's spirituality is entering Europe and America in an ever increasing measure that movement will grow amid the disasters of the time more and more eyes are turning towards her with hope and there is even an increasing resort not only to her teachings but to her psychic and spiritual practice so there is this gift of india 
to the world, that movement has already begun and more and more people and nations are looking at these spiritual practices, psychic and spiritual practices. So that was one of his dreams, this gift of India going across the world. And interestingly, he wrote in 1914 this uh, synthesis of yoga, the first paragraph, first chapter, exactly 100 years down the line, 2014, 11th December, the United Nations adopted the resolution to make 21st June as the International Day of Yoga. So now it is a global movement. But what we see predominantly is yoga being looked upon as a health and fitness practice. And that too, primarily Hatha Yoga, the asanas and pranayamas, and to a great extent, now the meditation, these are looked upon. So there is a need for really looking deep into all the yogic traditions of India, various schools of India, specialized practices, and to really discover the essential truth that will give them integration so that every path, every practice has a rightful place and we understand them from a deep spiritual perspective. And that's the work that he has taken up in this book. So with this, we come to the first episode of Synthesis of Yoga Studies. Thank you for your time, attention. I would really love to hear from you the feedback, suggestions for improvement. I'm not even sure what should be the length of this podcast. What should I touch upon? What I need not elaborate? Whatever it is. And what are the insights you got through these sessions? Because if it is really benefiting you, that will really be greatest joy for me to know that. So let me know. Give me your feedback. Post your comments below. And uh, in the descriptions, I will also add links to where you can find these books, PDF copy, online reading, searchable version, or to buy print. Ideally, keep a copy of the book while listening to this podcast so that you can do a deep dive and immerse in Shirobindo's thought and vision. And uh, let's share this gift that he has given us. Thank you. See you for the next episode.